Welcome to our panel discussion. Today's topic is uh, what added value could the Eastern neighborhood countries bring to the European Union with their gradual integration? Today's discussion is a continuation of uh, yesterday's one, where we talked about uh, Europe as a civilizational choice, as well as what can the EU offer to the Eastern neighborhood countries, as well as what added value could the Eastern neighborhood countries bring to the European Union with their gradual integration. And all this in the context of the war in Ukraine. We had uh, in the studio MEPs from the ECR group. We included in this conversation uh, speakers live from Ukraine, from Lviv and Kiev, also from Belarus, Armenia and Georgia. During today's panel discussion, we will address a broad question of uh, a long-term impact on the European Union of the opening uh, integration process with the Eastern neighborhood countries. In particular, the implication uh, that this gradual opening towards these might have for European economy, security and defense policy, as well as on European demography, societies and values. Uh, obviously, our debate uh, today will be also dominated uh, by the war in Ukraine and uh, the answer of the world and Europe for all this. I'm Milena Milutinova. Uh, I'm uh, uh, usually hosting Brussels One TV show on Bulgarian TV, but now I will moderate this uh, conference on the future of Europe. Now, uh, 
Uh, let me introduce uh, uh, our speakers uh, of uh, uh, the panel, Mr. Uh, Luc Pierre Duvin, uh, Deputy Managing Director, Director for Russia, Eastern Partnership, uh, Central Asia and OSC, European External Action Service, as well as uh, uh, to our uh, MEPs, uh, Professor Zdzislav Krasnodievsky, Chair of the ECR Working Group of the Institutional Reform, who is on uh, our remote connection, and Mr. Herman, Herman Tersh, Member of uh, the Foreign Affairs uh, Committee in the European Parliament. Uh, Mr. Devine, uh, uh, going uh, to you, what impact will uh, Russia's aggression on Ukraine uh, have on the Eastern Partnership Initiative, both in a short and a long-term perspective? Thank you, and thank you for inviting me, and uh, good morning, honorable members of the European Parliament. Um, I would say, first of all, that my, my first thought today is for the Ukrainian people that are suffering terribly and absolutely unjustifiable act of aggression by Russia, a full-scale invasion, completely unjustified uh, under the absolutely ridiculous pretext that, I quote, a genocide is ongoing in Ukraine. Um, after eight years of uh, negotiations stalled by Russia in Donbass, where Russia, when it was asked, what exactly do you wish to bring peace to Donbass? And the answer was constantly, we do not wish anything. We're not a part of this conflict. We now see how all this was lies. Now, coming to the East Partnership, um, the Eastern Partnership has never been uh, a security or military type of arrangement. It was a partnership uh, aimed at uh, developing economically, bringing a closer uh, political association and economic integration with the EU. And it was a successful one. And throughout the years, a number of agreements were concluded, and all of them, I would say, were quite successful. We had uh, the people, we had uh, visa uh, free regime uh, for the three associated countries. We also witnessed, unfortunately, that Armenia was not allowed uh, to sign the agreement had planned. Nevertheless, we signed with Armenia another agreement uh, after they joined the Eurasian Union, proving also that, um, unlike Russia, we were not playing a zero sum uh, game that you had to choose between being friend with the EU and friend with Russia. We've never played that game at all. We've always told everyone keep uh, your links, your traditional links with Russia. Now, uh, Russia has decided to invade the country, as I said, uh, despite, and I want to underline that nothing in the association agreement between Ukraine and, and, and EU had anything to do with NATO membership, etc., uh, which anyway, anyone uh, knew uh, is a very uh, old perspective. Um, but uh, the consequence, of course, is a, is a further dividing line in Europe, further polarization. Um, <clears throat> we now, uh, we now, we now, have, of course, uh, members of the Eastern Partnership who are legitimately afraid of uh, of Russian uh, rational uh, uh, reaction. Um, nevertheless, uh, the consequence will be more support for Ukraine, uh, very much so. With, um, with an emergency uh, system of 1.2 billion euro, um, and and uh, also uh, further uh, uh, loans and grants, what we've been doing since 2014 already. Uh, we have seen also, of course, a, a very strong, quick, and effective unity uh, in terms of, of sanctions. But in terms of, um, to go back to your question of Eastern Partnership, obviously Belarus, uh, due to its uh, already because of its uh, illegitimate um, uh, uh, elections uh, and the um, you know, of the uh, Lukashenko regime already on the margin of this partnership. So this is, will be another uh, consequences. Um, so um, I would say more unity, more support for Ukraine, both in the short and the long term. And I don't have the time here, but of course, to mention the immense efforts in terms of uh, helping the refugees but helping also the Ukrainians in Ukraine uh, and the humanitarian assistance. And unfortunately, uh, considering the aggravation, and I'll finish by that, of uh, last night indiscriminate shelling in the uh, second largest city, the country, uh, of course, uh, inflicting uh, civilian damages and, and, and casualties, we're afraid uh, are looking towards a very uh, sad and dire humanitarian situation. 
Uh, and I want to, to thank, of course, also the member states, Poland, starting with, with a large number of refugees that said that. Thank, thank you. you very much, uh, uh, Mr. Duvin. Uh, Professor Krasnodiewski, uh, do you have any comment on, the, on uh, what, uh, what just uh, Mr. Duvin said? Uh, in the context of uh, the yesterday resolution of the European Parliament as well? Um, yes, uh, first of all, of course, I am very satisfied, as uh, was stressed, that we are now uh, react to this crisis uh, united, and there is a general condemnation of uh, Russian aggression. Um, yesterday we saw this in the European Parliament. But um, I think that we have to be much more self-critical uh, uh, about our policy, because uh, um, there is not a secret that for many, also member states, but also for many people in the Brussels, uh, is their partnership was uh, considered a little as a substitute of the opening up the perspective to uh, join the EU, that uh, we did not uh, enough to support uh, um, Ukraine, also in this, uh, in military terms. Yeah. I just to remember, you know, if we go back, let's say, 10 days ago, there are many controversial um, um, reaction of the of the leading European politicians uh, and just to to mention the, uh, this already famous helmets from Germany to 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 Ukraine or the, the, the questions if we should support or not uh, very based on the big illusions uh, negotiation with uh, uh, with Vladimir Putin um, and we have, I think, to reconsider uh, our policy in different, not only um, in this uh, sense of uh, the external action and uh, partnership, but our climate policy, energy policy. How it was that we never had uh, uh, in Brussels a really deep discussion about the dependency on energy supply from, uh, from, uh, from, uh, from, uh, from Russia. It was very characteristic, and so that this is why my questions: Do you see any weakness of our our policy, and how should we change it in the in, in the future? And how can we convince some powerful member states in the European Union that what they did in the in the past was wrong? And then we have to reconsider our defense policy, security policy, our energy policy. And so, do you hope uh, there would be really change? And because, you see, I remember the, of course, it was different scale, but I remember 2014, this was also a little shock, but then after, after a while, we, we went back to the business. And uh, I remember that uh, if my group, political group, and I myself, we proposed to discuss the Nord Stream 2, that there was no inclination. But, to, to do so, so in European Parliament and, 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 and so on. Do you think, really, do you think that uh, Brussels elites can change, uh, can change the world view? Because, uh, world view, because we are living really in the geopolitical, very dangerous situation. And I think many, many leading politicians of, of, of European politicians didn't want, didn't want to notice this. Thank you. All these questions are very relevant to the situation we have in Ukraine now. Uh, Mr. Tersh, uh, what's your comment on that? Uh, uh, and uh, uh, you've been uh, a correspondent to the Eastern Europe uh, before entering the European Parliament in the 80s or 90s. Uh, what do you think uh, about the situation now? Um, having in mind your background uh, uh, on this field uh, in the past. I am very surprised that uh, some people try to, to bring us now the, what is happening as a, more or less as a, as a natural catastrophe. I mean, it was, uh, it was there, uh, the, the Russia, Putin, 
uh, invited and annexed uh, Crimea. And even so, we have had the major power inside the European Union doing his, uh, his Nord Stream 2 with against the against the opinion of of most of the of the of all of the eastern uh, europe countries members of the european union but also of some of the of the west and nothing, nobody nobody cared they made the agreement with schroeder there schroeder as one of the main uh, main staff members of the of the kremlin uh, should he be under sanctions now well, I mean, as I, well I guess as, uh, something. Russian I mean, uh, the, 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 the Mr. Schroeder is since he left the chancellor uh, chancellery. We don't know if before he left the chancellery, he was already there uh, doing uh, doing uh, business with with uh, Putin. But what we know is that after he, he he quitted the chancellery, immediately he went into the oil business of Russia and he became one of the uh, one of the of the main staffers of of Putin. I mean, when Putin when Putin renewed his. Uh, his presidency, one of the first persons he he greeted, if not the first, were the uh, were the patriarch and Schroeder were there, uh, just in uh, next to in the Kremlin, in the in the throne, in the throne hall of the of the Kremlin. I mean, it's and he is a man of the SPD of the Social Democrats of Germany. But even with Merkel, I mean, we have seen what uh, what has happened in Nord Stream uh, was there and. Trump came to Europe and spoke to the NATO and everybody insulted Trump. And here in this parliament, I mean, what the things they said about Trump when Trump said the truth. The United States gives the, the money for the defense of Europe and Europe is and, and Germany is doing uh, his business and, and giving hundreds of thousands of 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 um, um, uh, millions to the to the United to the Russia uh, because of the uh, of the gas and was preparing uh, far more in the biggest dependency and axis between Moscow and Berlin over the shoulders and over the back uh, of of all the other Europeans. I mean, there have been many things happening here which which uh, were seen because we are in other things. We are. Uh, accusing and we are harassing Poland and we are harassing Hungary because they don't want to have an L LGTB education in the in the schools. What is not the business of the Commission and what is not the business of the European Union because it's it's no it's it's no competence of the European Union the the the, the education the national education. But we have continuous interference from the from the Commission and from the European Union in 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 questions of the of the member states which are not given uh, competences in the treaties they are violating the treaties and overreaching completely inside the european union but they did nothing about nothing really nothing about the, about the issues the really compelling issues that we had and one of them is the threat the threat of of putin which was coming up and, in, and the threat of china and thanks god we have made a change, a quick change of mind in 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 China last year. Last year is finally, but we had we had on 30th of December of the year before we had Mrs. Merkel and Miss, uh, Mr. Macron and Mrs. von der Leyen and Mr. Xi Jinping doing a, an overall new investment plan, which was absolutely crazy, and and now we have seen the change of mind here of Mrs. von der Leyen, whose role as a Minister of Defense of Germany was said by, said by the German press, a real catastrophe. Eh? It, they made now a turn in three days because the heroic Ukrainian resistance. If the Ukrainians would have been defeated in three days, everybody knows it, we would be almost in business as usual as we were after Crimea with the Russians. It has been the change, the historical change that we are now having is a change that is provoked by this moral, moral reaction of priorities. And the priority has been shown by Ukraine. Thank you, Mr. Tersha. Now back to uh, Mr. Duvin. 
Mr. Devin, how does uh, uh, the European Union plan to, to support the uh, Eastern uh, Partnership countries that uh, they are most being affected uh, now, like Ukraine? Thank you. Well, let me first perhaps uh, say a word of, of comments of what has been said, uh, because uh, of course we can we can do history and we can uh, uh, wonder what would have happened if. But there's a couple of things with which uh, which which Mr. Tesha said with with which I disagree. I cannot agree that it was business as usual after 2014. Uh, yes, of course, member states uh, have always had different views and opinions on because of geography, history, sometimes economy. But, and I want to underline this, and this has surprised the Russians, they were united in actions because the sanctions, the three packages of sanctions that follow the illegal annexation of Crimea and the Donbass war created by Moscow and supported by Moscow were renewed unani unani with unanimity, unanimously, every six months since 2014. Who would have believed that it would have been the case for so far eight years? And number two, uh, ironically, uh, uh, the, the, this terrible invasion of Ukraine has, has done more for European unity every Russia than, than anything else in, in the last decades. And the unprecedented sanctions, also taken with unanimity, and, and Moscow uh, today, um, has demonstrated uh, really, uh, that probably Mr. Putin has completely miscalculated, just he had miscalculated it in 2014. Uh, so the problem is, of course, this is somebody with nuclear missiles that's, that keeps miscalculating. Um, now, back to your question, madam, uh, on, on the support, uh, of course, uh, for, for Ukraine, uh, which is a priority, which is, first, of course, humanitarian assistance, um, where uh, the Commission has already uh, provided 200 million euro in emergency, of course, access to water, uh, for uh, protection of, uh, of rehabilitation of damaged houses, schools, hospitals, etc. Uh, there will be more in, in the long run. There will be uh, 5.2 billion uh, euro, sorry, 5.6 billion uh, to, to Ukraine. There is also support for the Belarusian people, of course, the people, not uh, not the government, which comes to legitimate. Uh, and you have seen the President of the Commission announcing uh, 30 million uh, in favor of freedom and support uh, to to the people fighting for them. And uh, also, there remains a package of 3 billion euros ready in case in case Belarus would uh, undertake uh, the democratic route, which of course, and for the farm being uh, at the thank you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Duvin. Uh, now, uh, do you have any comment, uh, uh, Professor Krasnodiebski, your final remarks, uh, just in short, one minute? Yes, yes, I have. First of all, yeah, that's right, there, there were sanctions, but the, the questions were they effective. If we look now today at, at Europe and to look how big was the influence of the Russia in many countries, you know, 100,000 of the um, uh, rich Russian who have a property in, in, in France, uh, uh, did we uh, ever discuss, you know, the, the network of influence in, uh, in Germany? This is not only Schroeder, this is, uh, this is Madame Schwesing, this is uh, this man, many people. And uh, did we ever discuss critically the policy of, of Angela Merkel? And uh, you see, I am convinced that if we do not stop uh, Putin now, the next would be, after the Kiev, there, there would be Warsaw. There was, and at the day before, before this aggression, I, I flight. Uh, had a fl flight from from Warsaw to to uh, to Brussels, and there was uh, this famous commission, you know, from Affet and uh, and Libe about a uh, rule of law uh, in in Poland. And I think it's totally wrong priority. It's uh, it, they are useful idiots, useful idiots of Putin, who have no really this arrogance, no knowledge, and there is uh, there is a totally total exaggeration of some problems and total blindness, blindness 
to own problems in own country, because if this member, let's say, from Germany or Spain or, or, or uh, France, member of this of this commission looked at their country, they had different uh, different conclusion. So this is now not the time for common plans. This is not time for to just really to look at itself and change the political radically because Putin will not stop. And I am, I, I must say, I am afraid that all this, th these are all the beautiful words, yeah. But now the, 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 the Ukrainians, they are fighting for, for survival. And this, this is the question. So what we are doing to, 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 to uh, that Ukraine survives independent state. Thank you. To have an answer of this question, Mr. Well, yeah, yeah, I think I think the obvious frustration by Putin because of the developments uh, these days can bring us to a, bring us to a very a very dangerous uh, situation. But I think the whole priorities in the European Union have to have to change. I mean, this kind of of pushing pushing for for an ideological homogenization as they as they are trying with uh, with uh, with all this with all this. These questions of the of the climate, of the ecology, of pushing on the on the, the this this green deal, and so I think we have to change completely the priorities in 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 Europe and go to 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 really the the the, the things that that matter now and the things that matter is that we have a, a continent with enormous difficulties. We have, as the, as as Krasnodevsky said, I mean, we have a country where we have communists uh, which are allied with, to put or to put in in government. We have we have a government who, who is who has close ties, close ties to Maduro, who is as an extreme ally and to Cuba, who are extreme allies of 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 Putin, who are corrupted in the in the in corrupted connection of the Spanish government with the Venezuelan government, as we have deep deep implied in the Grupo de Puebla, in the Foro de Sao Paulo, where the drug cartels are and so on, and the Russians and so on, and nobody cares here. And we are speaking about the schools of Hungary. I mean, as I say, we have to change priorities and look for, for defense and solid defense and, and, to, and, to, and to look for, for the well-being of our, our people, of the people, and not to, to the programs of ideology, which we are developing here to enormous cost and really uh, ignoring the interests of the nations of Europe. That's the main issue now. Thank you, Mr. Tersh. Uh, thank you, gentlemen. Uh, we are going to our uh, next uh, panel discussion, Mr. Duvin. Thank you very much for uh, your contribution to this uh, conference. Uh, don't uh, go away, we, we are coming back in a minute. Now we have uh, our new speaker uh, in uh, uh, our debate, uh, Professor uh, Korosteleva, Professor uh, Elena Korosteleva, po political scientist uh, from the University of uh, Kent and uh, co-founder of the Oxford Belarus Observatory. Uh, Ms. Uh, Krasnosteleva, welcome to our program. Uh, would you tell us please uh, uh, what exactly uh, brings you to um, such a critical um, assessment of the uh, uh, Eastern Partnership. Uh, has any of uh, these uh, six uh, Eastern Partnership uh, country, countries, uh, has uh, any of these uh, real chance uh, to uh, enter the European in the near future? Well, first of all, thank you very much for inviting me. And, um, now about the limitations of Eastern Partnership. Of course, there are many fold advantages for Eastern Partnership for the EU policy towards the neighborhoods and uh, Eastern neighborhood in particular. But as an academic, I cannot ignore also the limitations of this policy and how we execute it on the ground. And I would say that, uh, uh, yet again, there are 
perhaps two important things to mention here. One is conceptual, that, uh, you know, related to the theory and practice of democracy. We still um, tend to be very, very Eurocentric, uh, and uh, whereas we need to pluralize and contextualize our understanding of, of democracy, we need uh, to accept that there are perhaps other different values and traditions and so on, and put less emphasis on institutions which remain conditional for uh, working, for example, with our partners um, in, in the neighborhoods. If democracy is about people, their ideals, their sense of good life and what they want uh, to be in the future as communities, then it's not really about institution. It's, it's, it's less about institutions. And we need really to start solving this equation uh, from understanding our partners first. And that's where Belarus perhaps, and now Ukraine once again, serves as another um, uh, example. Uh, Belarus uh, in particular, um, uh, which uh, went through the revolution of indignation. We fail to understand this country because we tend to focus too much on institutions and to working with the regime rather than with the people. And um, now, methodologically, um, yet again, you mentioned it in your paper, uh, that, that, that we, we tend to focus too much on premeditated templates, uh, on the assessments, on, on, on how to um, evaluate what has been achieved, goals, and so on and so forth, all at the expense of communities, living communities that uh, have to go through all these difficulties, hardships, change, and now even war uh, that um, our Ukrainians um, are experiencing at the moment. Uh, the EU put a very interesting concept of, re concept of resilience without actually understanding the very meaning of resilience. Resilience is all about uh, looking it into inherent resources, strengths, um, ideals, and motivations, aspirations to achieve good life. So why do we come then with our goals, with our measures with our evaluation templates. We need to see how people, wh where people want to be as communities in the first place. And final remark here is that if Europe uh, 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 should be civilizational choice for our neighbors, then Europe should really lead by example in a sense of being, first of all, flexible, understanding, engaging, reflective, and also mature in providing um, its guidance and support. Um, Europe, um, we, we fail, we as Europe, we already failed Belarus. Uh, which to a degree served as a precursor to what is now happening in Ukraine. Belarus already experienced uh, Russia's peaceful invasion. So what we see now in Ukraine is a, a little too late. And we need to put our act together now, as previous speakers already noted. If we don't, we are going to lose the entire neighborhood. And Russia will stand stronger than ever before. And uh, we, 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 we need to understand that. Thank you. Uh, well, Professor uh, Korosteleva, we are aware that uh, you will have uh, to leave us uh, very soon. So uh, I would uh, take advantage uh, from your presence here uh, with us and uh, ask you uh, for your views on the, the consequences that uh, Russian uh, aggression supported by Belarus, Russian aggression on Ukraine will have uh, for your country, for Belarus. Okay. Uh, well, first of all, um, we need to uh, distinguish between uh, Belarus regime, Lukashenko's regime, and Belarusian people. It is actually the Belarusian people who stand ready uh, on the border uh, with U Ukraine, actually receiving a lot of uh, uh, families in need and refugees. Um, it is actually Belarusian diaspora who actually puts together a lot of money as well and all necessary aid in order to support people in Ukraine. Um, so there is a massive difference between what Lukashenko does and what Belarusian people do uh, who stand strong and in support uh, with Ukraine. So the consequences are that we need to, to tell very loud uh, to send this message that Belarusians are all against the war. They experienced the hardship of war, where um, a, a third of the country was absolutely decimated. The, the Belarusians have never been in support of the war, and they stand with Ukraine, and they want to remove all this. It's the war against dictatorships, and the consequences for Belarus are absolutely decimating uh, in a sense that um, 
we we do not want to 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 to, to associate to be associated with regime regime of Lukashenko, and therefore it is very important to send that me, me, that message loud and clear. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Professor uh, Korosteleva. Uh, we know that you have uh, limited uh, limited time uh, with us, uh, so thank you uh, very much. Uh, do you want uh, something to add to our discussion? Some final words. Uh, 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 yes, just perhaps the final words is that we need, as Europe, we need to act now. And I think previous speakers already emphasized that. All the sanctions, I know I can see unprecedented um, uh, move towards supporting Ukraine worldwide. Um, we're already into a third um, package of sanctions against Russia. It's still, it has to be much quicker than that and much firmer than that, because until Russia, uh, uh, Russian regime hurts, uh, there will be no stop to war, and people are suffering everywhere. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Professor Korosteleva, for being uh, with us. Uh, uh, Professor Yelena Korosteleva, uh, political scientist from the University of uh, Kent. Uh, and now back to, to our uh, speakers uh, in the studio and uh, uh, online on remote uh, connections. Uh, uh, Professor Krasnodiewski, uh, what's your comment on uh, Professor uh, uh, Korosteleva just said? I, I totally agree, of course, because and I think unfortunately um, the European Union didn't have this kind of policy was described by Professor Korosteleva. It is rather it was dogmatic, one-sided, uh, ideological, and, and and so on. And really, sometimes you, you, you know, all of the billars was half forgotten because uh, we always gave a word, you know, in the European Parliament, and there is some invitation, and there are some ovation, and afterwards there is a, uh, as I said, already business and usual. And you know, I'm talking from Warsaw to you. And in Warsaw, we have really this a center of the political life of also Belarusian. We have also, the, the, there, is a, there is a TV in Belarusian language. And I remember, you know, many years ago, this very absurd discussion with some German, German politicians and diplomats, if we have to support uh, uh, Belarusian language, if shouldn't uh, be a TV in, in, in Russian, not in, in Belarusian. And the same is now about about Ukraine. When you are on the street of, of, of Warsaw, you 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 hear the Belarusian and uh, or Ukraine language everywhere, and there is a spontaneous support for the for the people. It is not uh, for 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 refugees and and, and 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 so on, but there is also a reaction as a political reaction, and there is also yesterday I I, I heard. I, uh, I read that there are some Latvian, uh, Lithuanian, Lithuanian and Latvian re uh, volunteers who are going to fight for, for Ukraine. And this is, of course, individual decision because we cannot do this as a NATO state. But this kind of help, political and military help, is, 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 is very important in this, in this situation. And not just, you, you know, sentimental words, just for, for for a minute or for a week, and afterwards we are going to, today. I, I must say I was shocked because we we had a discussion about this conference future of Europe and how the colleagues from the Spinelli Group think think that uh, what actually Ukrainians are fighting for this is their vision of of Europe. It is not Ukrainians are defending defending fatherland defend own nation and we need the Europe of nation and not the Euro, Euro of Alter, Europe of Alteris, Alteria Spinelli. Uh, we plan to have a connection here with uh, uh, Mr. Uh, Taras Vozniak, cultural and political scientist from Ukraine, but there is no connection, maybe due to the circumstances uh, and what's happening in uh, Ukraine nowadays. But Mr. Taras, we're back like, to you. I would like to insist that in what Krasnodevsky says now. I mean, we are seeing now this effort. They, have, they were waiting a few days. They said no Eurovision, no Eurocup. For, for Putin because he's very bad, because he enters 
uh, Russia, when they saw the resistance of the of the Ukrainians, they started to see that it was a, a, something historical what is happening. And now they the, then they reacted on the third day. They they reacted in the European Union, and now they want to sell us that the Ukrainians are fighting for Brussels, are fighting for a European Union, eh, which has priorities in the LGTB education or in the climate, uh, in the Greta Thunberg uh, rhetoric. I mean, no, no, let's, let's not be distracted here from what is really serious. I mean, the Ukrainians are fighting for their fatherland. They are fighting for their nation, for the existence, for the very existence of the nation. Like the Spaniards did it in 1808 against the French for the existence of the nation. That's the fight which uh, they are doing. And that is the fight, the, 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 the heroic fight of a nation for uh, itself, for itself. Now, then they are fighting for liberty, for the freedom, and for the freedom of others as well. They are doing that. But we are, they are not fighting they are not fighting for the program of our here consensus of of, uh, of socialist kind of mega state which they Mr. are building. Kersh, which what are, are building. the chances of Ukraine <laughs> to join the European Union uh, very soon? You know uh, that uh, the President Zelensky called uh, for an urgent procedure on that. I think when the procedure can, can be can be uh, can, should be open uh, because we we need a signal a signal to everybody that they have to stop us. We have seen the threats against Sweden and against Finland from 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 Russia, saying that they, they they are forbidden by Moscow to enter the NATO. I think the first response should be apply to NATO. That's the first the first question that the first uh, question that they should uh, should do uh, the first step. But uh, the application of Ukraine uh, for the, the European the Union is on the, the table. It's on the table. Yeah, yeah. Well, I, I think we have to. We have to. There will many, many things happening in this, in this, in these days and in these weeks. But I think we should proceed. We should proceed. I mean, Russia will also change. I mean, uh, Putin for the first time. Putin is in front of their people as a failed figure because he has failed. He thought in three days he would have managed. And he thought it would be a procedure like the one in Crimea for whole Ukraine. And he would have Ukraine and the European Union would protest and would put this kind of sanctions as they defend. And with these sanctions, everybody can live with it and uh, Ukraine would be finished. Eh? That's not the case. It was the case with Belarusia, as we saw. It was a case. He thought he could repeat it in, in Ukraine. He, has, he hasn't been able. Ukraine had time enough to, to, to create a defense. Eh? And he, they had time enough, two generations or one generation at least, to create self-consciousness against, the, against the, this kind of, of aggression. And they have uh, succeeded in resisting. They may be annihilated now, maybe. But they have resisted so long that the message is over the over the world now. And now we have there a case that is uh, for us to to proceed and 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 to change. He wanted to change the map of of Europe for himself for this. He wanted to restore this Soviet Union whose disappearance he thought thinks was the greatest catastrophe of last uh, of last century. We have to create new Europe, but not a Europe, a centralized Europe where von der Leyen and the Germans say what has to be done and, and nobody can. And there are no, there are no nations which are the only, the only uh, uh, way of having democracy is our nations. Do you see any parallel, uh, since you have been uh, a correspondent uh, uh, for the Eastern Europe yeah. uh, uh, decades ago, uh, can you make uh, uh, any parallel f uh, between those times uh, uh, and nowadays? Well, there is the, 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 the push. The push for freedom is here because the threat of a restoration of the worst is there. We have a Putin who wants to restore, uh, restore the worst 
a regime possible that is the Soviet Union in the, in the in the sense of a, of an imperial uh, imperial way of of suppressing of suppressing all the all the freedoms and all the rights of all the people who are under his boot uh, and that was the Soviet Union uh, this is a a time where we have to fight against this kind of monstrous restoration of the worst but we have to fight against the tendencies to create a monster here eh? a monster a social democratic monster who finally eh, whips out every dissent and whips out any any differences between the nations that would bring us to the same conclusion as a as a as a soviet union in this sense eh, let's let's be honest with the with the national fight of of the Ukrainians, but also honest with the national fight of the of the Poles of their sovereignty, the Hungarians, and all the nations in the European Union. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Tersh. Uh, uh, since uh, we still don't have connection with uh, uh, Tarasa Vozniak uh, uh, from uh, Ukraine, uh, we'll go to our next speaker, uh, Mr. Gian Nodia, a philosopher and uh, political uh, analyst, uh, analyst uh, from uh, the State University in Tbilisi, chairman at the uh, Caucasus Institute for Peace, Democracy and uh, Development and uh, former Minister of Education and Science of Georgia in 2008. Uh, Mr. Nodia, uh, uh, we hear that the, the cover, uh, government of uh, your homeland, Georgia, uh, which is uh, a country that uh, uh, in, in the past was uh, and actually is uh, still aggressed by Russia, refused to, to openly help Ukraine now. Uh, what is uh, the reason for, uh, for this lack of support? Okay, what can I say? Uh, we don't suffer in this war in the same way as Ukraine does, of course, materially. But uh, I would say in some way, in a moral way, at least we are in a worse condition because Ukraine uh, is uh, united around its uh, political leadership. Uh, Ukraine writes high moral ground. Ukraine is inspiration for Europe. It uh, sort of led to unprecedented unification of Europe. It's inspiration for the whole world. And uh, whichever way the war goes, I think Ukraine has already morally won this war. Uh, and I hope it will also ultimately win it politically and, uh, uh, and militarily as well. Uh, but in Georgia, we have uh, lost this war morally uh, because our government uh, took uh, the positions that it, that it has uh, taken of uh, a kind of superficially, symbolically here and there, uh, expressing solidarity to Ukraine, but effectively uh, not doing anything. It refused to join sanctions. It refused to allow Georgian volunteers who want to fight for Ukraine to leave uh, the country to Ukraine. Uh, and uh, its uh, rhetoric, uh, rhetoric is, uh, uh, I would say, closer to Russian rhetoric about the war uh, than to uh, European rhetoric. It, uh, our Prime Minister Haribashvili sort of said that uh, uh, okay, Ukraine failed to avoid war, so kind of indirectly blame Ukraine for the war, uh, and uh, that sanctions don't matter, and we only should, uh, it, uh, it, uh, this war does not really affect us, we should uh, uh, only take care of our uh, national interests, and we, because we will be damaged by economic sanctions, uh, by, by sanctions against Russia economically and politically, we should not uh, call Russia's uh, anger, uh, and uh, uh, that's the position of government. President Zurabishvili, Salome Zurabishvili, has somewhat different uh, rhetoric, quite different rhetoric, really, but it does not change much because our president has only ceremonial powers. And uh, this uh, made Georgia a very divided country uh, because the overwhelming majority of Georgians have feel strong uh, support, solidarity for, for Ukraine. And uh, uh, there is very big gap between 
government position and, uh, or, and, and position of the people. We have many protests, we have had in Georgia many protests uh, against government in many years, but I don't think that we ever had, had this kind of fundamental gap uh, in, in values and strategic direction of the country uh, between the government and the people. And uh, uh, we have these non-stop uh, demonstrations of protest. Uh, basically, I mean, uh, we had huge, uh, uh, the huge rallies, uh, uh, basically starting from the very first days of the war. And initially, it was just spontaneous expression of solidarity with Ukraine. Uh, but uh, as uh, our government uh, persisted in its uh, rhetoric, uh, these the demonstrations, apart from continuing to express solidarity for Ukraine, uh, they turned into a movement of protest against, against the government. And this, uh, um, this movement is a little bit confused what to do next, because we know that the situation is really dangerous uh, for the country also, and we can be Russia's next target. We all understand that, so destabilizing the country is also dangerous, but accepting the government as it is, it also uh, disgraceful, basically. I think the feeling this uh, part, uh, if solidarity is one feeling that unites Georgians, shame and this feeling of disgust and disgrace is another feeling that unites us. So in the sense, it may be similar if we look at Ukraine, with the period of Yanukovych. So, and uh, we know that uh, certain actions of Yanukovych also uh, caused great protest. But uh, we also know from Ukraine's history that it was extremely dangerous moment for Ukraine. So uh, the society in the sense is torn that we cannot accept uh, the government and, uh, but we, uh, don't know exactly how to deal with with this situation. Uh, so we have to change things, but we have to change things peacefully, as peacefully and uh, uh, within constitutional limits as possible. So not to give some kind of pretext to another Russian aggression. So we are in a very difficult situation right now. Yeah, we see. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Professor Nodia. Mr. Terso, uh, what, what is your comment on uh, well, yeah, what we, Professor we Nodia saw, just said? I mean, Georgia was one of the first uh, uh, countries to be, to, to, to be the victim of, a, of an aggression. When we, they started, uh, Georgia asked also for, for, the, for membership in, in NATO. There as well. In 2008? Uh, in 2008. Well, Ukraine, uh, Ukraine as well. And that is where uh, we saw the capability and the disposal of, of the disposition of, of Putin of, of the aggressions and of using this question of dividing a country, using different parts of uh, taking territories, uh, putting puppets uh, around in the, in, the, in the different regions, autonomous, so-called autonomous regions and so on. I mean, this, uh, this is a, 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 a kind of instrument you can use almost everywhere. You have, then, you have other, other, other countries which have suffered the same, the same fate, not as Ukraine but, and Georgia, but, uh, but also the, the same. Anyway, and I understand completely uh, the, the, the sense of, of, expose, of ex exposure and of danger that, that Georgia that Georgia has. I mean, I think the 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 position, the strong position of solidarity with with Ukraine, has to come from from the from the European uh, countries, which are in NATO, uh, uh, which are in NATO, and they are in NATO, and the eastern part of Europe is in NATO because they don't want the fate that Ukraine suffers now. I mean, there's, there's the, all this narrative of Russia of saying, well, the NATO was advancing towards Moscow. So no, it's not the NATO advancing towards Moscow. It's the countries which are close to Russia are, are really afraid of Russia and they want to be in NATO because, because they, 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 they risk and they know and they fear to, to, to share the, this fate 
that now uh, Ukraine is, is, is having and that Georgia had in, in his moment. So what Putin is doing is confirming the absolute need uh, that the, the Eastern European countries had to join as soon as possible the NATO to avoid these appetites of Mr. Putin or what name, other, other name could have come in, in, his, in his place. In this sense, we'll see what happens with, with the Baltic states. I think they are, they, they are really exposed. We have a Belarusia and we have, we have Kaliningrad in the, on the coast and we have a strip there. We, uh, we, I mean, who knows if, if they, they start from, from, from uh, Belarusia and incursion to connect with Kaliningrad and they cut off the three Baltic states. We have to count with everything in this, in this, in this situation with, with uh, Putin, who is, who is outraged by his failure uh, of failure of, of completing the, the plan. And, we, and are we going, uh, is really the NATO going to apply to the Article 5 if this thing happens and we have no territorial continuity between Poland and Lithuania? Uh, I, I mean, I, I, I want to see it because it may, 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 I, 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 what has happened is the effect and the result of weakness, of weakness of the United States and of weakness of Europe, of the weakness of the West, which has priorities which should not be priorities. And we are neglecting the real priorities, the real necessities in in in... Uh, I'm giving priorities to, re to ideological to ideological stuff. That is the problem. With Obama came the crack on Sy the, the Syrian uh, the Syrian question. In the Syrian question, Russia defeated uh, the Obama, and then came Crimea. Crimea is a result of Obama's weakness, and this is a result of seeing. This, what has happened this week, is a result of, of Putin seeing on the TV uh, what happened in, in Afghanistan, where Mr. Biden left behind Americans, left behind uh, hundreds of thousands of military equipment only to run away, to run away from the alleys and, 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 and go home because a convenience. Everything is a convenience. Uh, in this in this Western world, so uh, he was he saw that and he said, "Well, then I think I have a window of opportunity here for my convenience, and my convenience is to go into into Ukraine with another uh, American administration, with another attitude in in Europe. We wouldn't have had that, eh? but we were here." Very now, we, our, our fight in, in Europe is against eating meat, against our, against our, our agriculture, against our, our, um, against our, 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 our field, our agriculture, against our culture, against, against so many things, just not, we had not, no prior, priority in defense, we have no priority in security, we had priorities that I invented, most of them for delightment of this cultural uh, elites that we have in Europe and that we have in the different, in the different governments, uh, leftist government, leftist or social democrat uh, governments in Europe, which can be so-called central right, center left, it's the same, they are doing the same. Thank you, Mr. Teresha, for sharing your views uh, with us. Uh, before you. going back to uh, Professor Krasnodiewski and Professor Nodia, let me just mention that uh, uh, except uh, Tarasa Vozniak from Ukraine, uh, that uh, we, we have uh, not connection with him, uh, uh, maybe due... Oh, we, do we have this connection? Uh -huh. uh, Mr. Vozniak, uh, uh, welcome to our program. Uh, do you hear us? 
we lost him again. Uh, so sorry for losing him again. Uh, we've been lucky yesterday to have all our connections uh, in Ukraine, uh, both in uh, from Lviv and Kiev, and uh, we're trying to improve uh, uh, and uh, connect them. Um, to improve connection and uh, have Mr. Wozniak in our program. We, uh, we've been uh, planned, we intended to, uh, to include, uh, to involve in our program also uh, Mr. Vadim Pistrinchus from Moldova. He's a, a former uh, member of uh, Moldovian parliament and a former deputy uh, Prime Minister on, on Labour, but um, it's impossible to involve uh, him uh, in our conversation because uh, uh, he's uh, uh, just now he's helping uh, uh, the refugee, uh, the refugees, the refugees coming from Ukraine to Moldova, and he's uh, very much involved in this process. Uh, so it's impossible to to have him now. Uh, do we have uh, uh, a connection with with, uh, with uh, Ukraine now? Not yet. Not yet. Uh, uh, Professor Krasnodiebsky, uh, back to you with uh, your comments uh, on, uh, on uh, what uh, uh, Mr. Tersha just said. Yes, I, I just would comment about the situation in, in Georgia because uh, it's, a, it's a rather sad story. It shows how um, difficult is the situation when, when there is a, such a division. We all hoped that uh, Georgia would be actually a leader of the striving to the, to, to the, to the West, to NATO, uh, to European Union. Um, I have many friends uh, in uh, Tbilisi and I was many times there and I know that, uh, that generally Georgian people would like to, 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 to be and they are consider themselves as, 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 a, as a part of, of, of Europe, of Europe, Europe, Europe of nation. But uh, yes, uh, and we also hope that, uh, you know, after, especially after the Russian aggression 2008, yeah, and uh, the occupation of, of part of, of Georgia, that there the, the would be a, Mm, political unity and, uh, and unfortunately it is much more much more complicated that it shows also that uh, uh, yeah we have uh, look uh, always on this uh, political sides of, of the process and uh, how we uh, we uh, react to the to, to, to such a danger so we, we spoke at the first time that it is important that for me it's, uh, I think it is optimistic that now uh, we at least are united in, 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 in the EU as the, the, there are some controversies among members uh, member states for instance uh, yesterday the Polish Prime Minister proposed even more severe sanctions against against Russia we have to to overcome resistance of some, some member states who are very sometimes very concerned about own se 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 security and their own interests. And th this is probably, probably normal, but, uh, but, uh, but uh, I think in this situation we have, a, we have a different, uh, different uh, priorities. So let's hope that also Georgia will uh, change after this uh, example of Ukraine, because uh, as was rightly mentioned, uh, that uh, what is the game changer? It is not really the Russian aggression, because I think that in recent, let's say two weeks, three, three weeks, we had a warning from the United States, everybody actually was already prepared, there's only the questions, what the questions yeah, it would be the limited uh, intervention and, and, and so on. What is really game changer? It is a resistance of the Ukraine, a resistance of bravery of Ukrainians. They show because, you see, many French people, Germans, and that, that they think, you know, army, Russian ra army is indefensible, it, uh, it's in, uh, invisible. Yeah, that you cannot defeat this always victorious. There is a, there is a this myth of the of the 
of the superpower and that you have to to talk with uh, with ev uh, every uh, person on Kremlin because it's it's so important and so dangerous and so and now I think that uh, uh, President Zelensky as a shout as a shout as a how, how, what is the proper role of the president you know I I wish that. Uh, also, some European uh, leaders have uh, such a courage and, and, and character. But on the other hand, this, this will of the Ukrainian people to survive, to resist, and to, to be effective in, in, in defense, this, this really changed everything. And maybe it would also encourage Belarusian, but also Georgian, yeah? and I think also, also Europeans, also. French and uh, and and German that uh, um, to to rediscover you know some virtues which are uh, have forgotten in, in Europe like uh, courage, courage like uh, bravery, like uh, like uh, all these uh, military virtues which are necessary in 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 in, in this uh, in this world. Uh, Professor Nodia, uh, would you tell us about? Uh, uh, would you tell us, please, how how does uh, does the war in Ukraine has already changed uh, 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 the perspective of the uh, Eastern Partnership countries uh, to join EU in the near future? From your perspective, okay, I think it. Uh, it I agree completely that it is, it is a game changer that uh, Ukraine uh, uh, has. Already clear membership perspective, uh, something that we sort of uh, uh, dreamt about and insisted that we should be given at least theoretical kind of chance to be considered potential uh, candidate. And now everything changed, and of course it was changed because of uh, this persistence and strength of. Uh, of of, of Ukrainians. So I think we all in Georgia, or at least most people in Georgia, understand that Ukrainians also fight our war. And if uh, there is this change with regards to Ukraine, it means that uh, uh, it is also possible uh, with regards to Moldova and Georgia, uh, because those two countries are somehow, we were considered as a trio, basically, as some kind of three countries in the same boat uh, so, so far. Now Ukraine is, of course, uh, big, uh, different, but still, still, if it's possible for Ukraine, it should be possible for Georgia and for Moldova. So that's, uh, on the one hand, that's important source of new hope, but on the other hand, it's another reason for uh, exasperation and disappointment uh, within Georgia, that exact now that we have uh, this uh, great chance and situation has changed, we don't. We are represented by government which is not keen at all to take advantage of this chance, and that's that's a big problem for us. Mr. Tersh, uh, talking about the um, uh, future of Europe and uh, institutional changes that. Uh, uh, may happen uh, in the future within the Euro European Union. What do you think about uh, uh, the debate uh, on, on uh, um, European army, European military forces? Well, I think I, will, uh, I think everything what is uh, to, to create consciousness about security and bring the Europeans really to, to think about their, this, their own defense is good. I wouldn't. I. I. I am. I am not uh, in favor of decoupling, of decoupling defense on 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 NATO. I think we we have an enormous task today with uh, with 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 the challenge of China, and with all challenges uh, that that come before. We have we have a a need to have a a, a common transatlantic uh, uh, alliance, and I think NATO is is as necessary as. As always, when the war, or more than ever, um, but uh, of course, we were very welcome the Germans. For now, they are at last. Eh, they see that we need that the Germans invest something in in the army. The army in 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 Germany is a shame. 
It's an absolute shame. They, I mean, Spain is non-existent. Non-existent because they have been proud of destroying, of not investing in the last 20 years since Tapatero. There is, they are, they, we have a, now we have a, um, the, the chief of our government, the, 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 the president of the government, the Mr. Sanchez, uh, was saying that he would abolish the defense ministry. Von der Leyen was a, 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 a minister of defense who was almost, as I say, many of his compatriots say she destroyed the, the German army, definitely. Uh, so we have to reconstruct the defense in Europe. What about to the... Match, to match the, the challenges we have uh, and, to, and, to, and to create something worthwhile uh, and something, something solid in this in this alliance but we need the we need the alliance i wouldn't go i i i think it's 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 quite dangerous this this neutralization that some of them want and i think it's not realistic and i think it's 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 dangerous i hope we have soon another administration in 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 the states and i think we have also to look to uh, to latin america to have, we have we we need that Latin America does not fall in the hands of all the Putin friends of Maduro and Petro now in Colombia and and all the influence of Cuba and of the, of the of the cartels of the cocaine which are taking over which have a, they they really tore down the institutions in Chile and now are now bringing a constitution an extreme left constitution in in Chile we have Argentina now the danger is for Colombia and Brazil. I mean, they are the friends of Putin uh, working with lots of money from the drugs. Uh, and it's, it's an enormous challenge with the Chinese entering into uh, Latin America and the, and the Russians uh, being there and Hezbollah from Iran, you, as a tool of Iran. There are enormous challenges for all the Western world. And the Western world has to be together has to be together. We have to create solid alliances in South America as well in the South Atlantic, so that we, the the, the, the countries in freedom, the nations in freedom, uh, are, uh, are solidly defended and together, together. Uh, this is an, an enormous task for the for the future, and that doesn't come through a farm to fork, and this doesn't come through the New Deal, and this doesn't come through. Uh, taxes and taxes and taxes for unification of 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 and and dissolving the nations in a super state where nobody is really responsible, where nobody is really elected, and where the, the decisions are taken in absolute obscurity, as they are all, already now in the Commission. Mr. Krasnodiebski, uh, there was uh, uh, another long-going debate in the European Union about the European Intelligence Service. Uh, uh, what do you think about it? Talking uh, in the context of uh, the future of Europe and institutional reforms. Yes, I, I think that there are, um, I agree with colleague Tetsch that it is necessary that we as the Europeans do more for our defense. As probably you know, I was main rapporteur in the European Defence Fund. I supported this, and uh, um, but not uh, as not as a uh, competition to to, to NATO, but uh, as uh, support of, of the NATO. But we, what we need in Europe, uh, and this is also concerning the inter intelligence, it's a, we need a common strategic culture. That means, uh, and this cannot be created, you know, uh, uh, just uh, in a second. As a common strategic culture, it means that we define in the same way the, 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 the dangerous, we, the dangerous in, in the world, our priorities, and, and, and so on and so on. And uh, so we uh, have to uh, uh, and I, I, we had already this uh, this opinion. We we had uh, to be more flexible, and to understand that this uh, uh, this kind of the consensus we we now achieved in the because because and thanks to to, to Ukrainians, uh, 
the breviary. It is uh, something what we should work all all the time. But I am also as uh, 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 on our political group as a general, we are very skeptical about you, you, you know the only thinking in one way, one solution. Every crisis in the European Union should lead to the more centralization, to the more power to the to 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 to, to European institution. Today, I had in one of the meetings, you know, we need, of course, foreign policy which will which which should be based only on majority. Majority. What what does it mean? What kind of the new voice? We we see now uh, the, the the one voice, but uh, for whom uh, it, it should be the voice? How it should uh, this policy should be should be defined? This is the, this is the question. If there there would be, you know, uh, uh, if we remember 2014, then the lead after the crisis in uh, policy toward Ukraine was taken over by France and Germany. And what they started, that's why there was a Minsk agreement, which is totally uh, unuseful. There was a Normand for, Norman format, Normandic format, and the, the discussion, and, and so on. And my country, Poland, who was very, very important in creation Eastern Partnership, and also in supporting the um, uh, uh, striving for independence of the of the nation of uh, of Eastern Europe of Georgia, I re just to remember the visit of the organized by President Lech Kaczyński to defend Georgia to, to, to 2008, we were eliminated, you know, for the definition of the European of the EU policy toward toward the East, yeah, uh, be, because of. Uh, I, say, I would say interest of uh, French or Germans with uh, the very limited sanction with the very extended interest to cooperate in the energy uh, policy or something other with, uh, uh, with Russia. So we need Europe in which uh, I would say, um, yeah, we should uh, talk with one voice, but this voice should be based of equality of argument and uh, and uh, also the active role of the Eastern and East Central European countries, because we, we probably know better uh, what were the aims of the of the of the uh, of Russia and uh, uh, Putin. But I, I have a problem uh, questions to to Professor Notia. You probably know that there is now that this is also a part of. Uh, our discussion, this conference about discussion of future of Europe. We are now in this uh, negotiation. There are some proposals. There were citizens panels. There are now there would be next uh, week also the next plenary session about this conference from future of Europe. We discuss in in the union the questions: How should we change? How uh, uh, the European Union? And I think I think that. Uh, it is very important, very important that also the countries like your country, like Ukraine, yet like also Western ba ba Balkans, should be involved in this process. We uh, we also need your voice. How do you think, yeah, the Europe, future Europe? Because I I'm very hopeful and I'm very optimistic. You will be a member of the of the EU. Uh, sooner probably as, as we thought, yeah, and uh, probably in a different way should be this new extension of the Union should be managed because it's uh, probably impossible to do this like it was 2004 when, when Poland and Hungary and the uh, Czech Republic joined. But uh, my question is, do you follow up this discussion? Did, do you discuss this also at, at, at I, I mean, the civil society, at the universities, uh, 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 this different uh, vision of, of Europe and uh, some proposal even going uh, so far as to change uh, treaties? What kind of the, of the union you would like to, to, 
to join. Yeah, this is uh, this is I think important Professor important Nadia? questions. I think your yes, your please. your content will be very important. No, thank you, thank you very much for this very important question. Of course, we are not just uh, we not just want Europe uh, to join European Union to recognize our European identity and uh, get some benefits uh, that are related to, to European Union. We should uh, participate in this debate. I absolutely agree because Europe is uh, not some kind of finished project. Uh, Europe as civilization or uh, Europe uh, as EU, EU as uh, organization of Europe, as it were. Uh, so we have to, uh, even without being members of European Union, we should be participating in that debate and we are not doing that sufficiently. Uh, so uh, I think, uh, yes, Europe uh, uh, is uh, in some kind of identity crisis as we see it. Uh, and I think it's a problem. Uh, Europe, uh, Europe is a great project, but it's also a problematic project. I mean, European Union is a representative of Europe. And uh, there have been this kind of grand vision of Europe as kind of postmodern, postnational, uh, uh, political entity of uh, unprecedented kind. And uh, whether it's a good idea or bad idea, uh, it's more philosophical discussion. I don't think it works. I think we uh, see that uh, uh, most Europeans want strong Europe and want European unity, but they also want uh, preservation of their nationhood and uh, want uh, Europe of uh, strong Europe of strong nations, as it were. So. Uh, even if we think uh, somehow philosophically this kind of postmodern, postnational Europe is a good idea, I am not a big fan of it, but it does not matter. Maybe it's a good idea, but it doesn't. It's not working, and it's not. It cannot be based of, for consensus on the European level. Some people still support it, but there is strong opposition to it. So I think Europe should uh, find a diff different consensus which implies strong and united Europe. But I think this idea of Europe of nations, which was strong at least be before Maastricht Treaty, uh, it should uh, be kind of resurrected and, and, uh, and, and, and developed. And uh, it should be a ground for going forward. And I think uh, nations like for nations like Ukraine or for Georgia this is also natural because as it was said very correctly right now uh, Ukraine is uh, uh, fighting for its survival as a nation and its fighting as its bravery became inspiration for Europe to unify so uh, we cannot uh, uh, think that uh, uh, Ukrainians or Georgians really want uh, some kind of post-national, post-modern Europe. No, we want uh, European solidarity and uh, strong, uh, strong uh, uh, values which are linked to European civilization uh, and sharing sovereignty to some extent. Yes, absolutely. But uh, we need also strong European nations. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Nadia, for uh, your contribution to this debate. Uh, back to you, uh, Mr. Tersh, for your uh, final words and final remarks. And uh, uh, if I may uh, uh, ask you uh, also uh, uh, how the uh, ECR group in the European Parliament will uh, make sure that its vision for, uh, for the future of Europe uh, would be attractive for uh, Eastern Partnership countries. Well, I first want to uh, thank Mr. Nodia for his words because I think it's a perfect definition of of what uh, happens. We are we are fighting for us. And we have a there's a common civilization. We we have we have many things in common. We can share in some things the sovereignty, but we have to have strong nations, and we have to get rid of this ideological path. That we that we have 
uh, taken and incurred uh, in the European Union by the biggest and 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 the the mainstream for this this wish really this death wish for the nations uh, we have to we have to fight against this and we have to we have to uh, let get clear everybody has to get clear that that Europe without nations is no Europe it's a, it's a it's a super state which is something else it's something else and something very dangerous for liberty and very dangerous for all the values that are uh, essential for uh, for Europe I think ECR the ECR is the group that uh, best understands and best defends this uh, this this idea I think we will grow we will be every time more uh, our position is uh, is growing all over Europe from the west to the east all over the places and I think we we are going we are going to manage to avoid this monstrous uh, kind of a uh, uh, Social engineering, a monster that uh, that uh, von der Leyen and and the, the the big groups of the the today, today still the big groups in the in the parliament are, are pursuing. But uh, I think we in the next legislature, in the next term in the European Parliament, the different things will be different in every case and the possibilities of doing these things will be far less. That's why they are nervous and they are trying to push everything forward and using every excuse. Now they are with this, they are going to try to use the unity against, uh, against, the, against the Putin aggression, the unity with the, and the, the admiration for the, for the Ukrainian nation and the fight of the Ukrainian nation, they want to try to bring it as the fight for this program, this postmodern program that they want to impose to the European nations. I think they will not succeed. And I think with the courage of the Ukrainians, but with the courage of all the forces that are emerging in whole, in, in whole Europe, we will, we will have a, a Europe of nations a, Euro, a united Europe of nations fighting with their identity, with their millennial identity, everybody in its, in its nation together for defending freedom and for defending their rights, human rights, civil rights, and defending the understanding that we have for, of the human being that some people today want to destroy. Thank you very much, Mr. Teres, uh, for uh, being uh, with us. Uh, thank you very much, Professor Nadia uh, from Georgia. Thank you for uh, being with us and uh, sharing your views. Uh, we are closing this panel. Uh, don't go away. We are coming soon. The ECR Group is the voice of Eurorealism, the sensible middle way between ever more Europe and no Europe, with respect for the sovereignty of Europe's national democracies, with less bureaucracy, more fiscal responsibility, and equality for all member states. We believe the peoples of Europe want the European Union to do less and to do it better, to promote economic recovery and growth and more jobs, to help not hinder our countries in getting immigration under control, to deliver a clean environment at a cost we can afford, to work with global partners to protect our security, to create jobs through free and fair trade. Europe should only act where it can deliver real added value to member states and their citizens. By putting Europe's national democracies back in the driving seat, we can build a Europe that will offer our countries a platform for cooperation that will help promote European prosperity and security for generations to come.
Now uh, we, we have a message from Mr. Rafael Fito, uh, co-chairman of the ECR group. Uh, Mr. Rafael Fito, are you with us? Welcome once more to a new chapter of the ECR Europe's future campaign. Since December 2020, the ECR group started its own version of the Conference on the Future of Europe because we believe in a different view of Europe. In our vision, Europe is home to a unique heritage. It is a place where nations protect their culture and the traditions, a place where freedom, sovereignty and independence are defended, values which gave birth to our national democracies, promoting peace and prosperity. This neighborhood initiative from the CR Group is essential to listen to the opinions from all corners of Europe, to strengthen the cooperation in the continent. With this initiative, we would like to give the voice to those Europeans that are excluded from the official conference on the future of Europe, and to the states aspiring to EU membership or to closer integration with the, the European Union. Especially in this moment, it is very important to have an initiative like this. In fact, we strongly condemn the unjustified actions against Ukraine by the Russian Federation and this President Vladimir Putin. It represents a real attack on those principles of freedom and democracy, in which we firmly believe. That is why I want to express my full solidarity and closeness to the Ukrainian people. I would like to assure them of our full support to put an end to this indiscriminate attempt to violate the sovereignty and the territorial integrity of their country. We realize that there are many challenges ahead of us and we can overcome them only by acting together. In this way, we will ensure that Europe is a choice of civilization and freedom. Krasnodiebski, uh, how would you like to conclude this event? Uh, yes, I, I think um, that uh, this event showed that uh, our idea, our vision of Europe, a solidarity of between the nation, European nation, is uh, more actual than ever, and. Uh, we are now see that the fate of, of Europe, uh, destiny of Europe, is uh, probably will be decided in, in Kiev, and also in our reaction to to to, to this uh, heroic struggle of the Ukrainian people, um, and that uh, Europe we always uh, trust that uh, Europe uh, is something more and bigger than the. European Union in the current state of, of, of affairs. And um, so uh, we should also not forget that uh, uh, there are also other neighborhoods uh, we organize, uh, as uh, was mentioned by colleague Tetsch, uh, the discussion with uh, uh, states of the Latin America and people, but uh, our next stage concerning these questions of the prospect of Europe, of the future of Europe, would be on the Western Bal Bal Balkan. Because we shouldn't forget that the people of Serbia, Montenegro, Albania, Bosnia, Herzegovina, Kosovo, North Macedonia are Europeans too. And also their voice should be heard in this discussion about the future of Europe. As we had today, the, the voice of our colleagues from from Belarusia, from uh, Georgia. Unfortunately, we couldn't connect with uh, Lviv today, but I hope uh, we will s remain in the permanent dialogue with with the Ukrainians, with Belarusian, um, Georgian, Moldavian um, colleagues, and other countries. And the next, as I said, the next. Uh, now, our next conference would be about uh, about Western Balkans. Uh, we also will refer to the to the current situation, and we hope that, uh, as, as was many times said, that uh, this event uh, 
tragic event, this Russian aggression, but above all the heroic struggle of Ukrainians for national independence will change something. Europe will contribute that uh, that we build will build up the better future of of Europe and uh, we reform also the European Union in this way in which we'll fit more to the European values and European interests. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Krasnodiebski. Uh, this is how we conclude uh, this event, this uh, panel discussion. And uh, 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 once again, uh, um, to uh, remind you that uh, um, another discussion is coming up uh, in the end of March on the 29th and 30th of March. Uh, focused on uh, the Western Balkans. Uh, thank you very much indeed, uh, uh, Mr. Krasnodebski, um, uh, for your important contribution. I yes. I wanted to thank you very much for, for, uh, for hosting our event. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you for... Uh, inviting me to host this event. I'll be glad to host the, uh, the next event uh, on the Western Balkans uh, at the end of uh, March. Uh, and uh, all this, uh, uh, like the debate uh, yesterday and uh, uh, today, will be in the context of uh, uh, the war in uh, uh, Ukraine, the circumstances uh, that are around us and uh, we cannot uh, avoid them. Uh, thank you very much indeed. Uh, um, We'll see you again uh, uh, the, uh, on the, uh, at the end of March uh, and we'll talk about uh, uh, the other uh, region very close uh, to European Union, Western Balkans. There's a new hope for Europe, a Europe of jobs, prosperity, and recovery. A Europe that safeguards its citizens and borders. There's a Europe that respects its national democracies, that protects the environment and nurtures its rural economies. There's a Europe that does less and does it better that cuts bureaucracy and adds value for you. There's a Europe that looks inwards and outwards for trade, for security and for friendship. It's time to get Europe under control and back on track. It's time for a new hope for Europe. It's time to reset EU.